Welcome to the CME activity entitled Spotlight on Ironclad, Clinical Review of IV Iron Replacement Therapy for Cancer and Chemotherapy-Induced Anemia. This activity is supported by an educational grant from American Regent. My name is Jeff Guillory. I am a clinical professor in the Department of Pharmacotherapy at the University of Utah and clinical hematology-oncology pharmacist at Huntsman Cancer Institute, an NCI-designated center at the University of Utah. My disclosures are seen here. We will be discussing off-label uses of IV iron preparations. In this activity, I will briefly describe the initial workup of anemia in patients with cancer, but the majority of the discussion will focus specifically on iron deficiency in chemotherapy-induced anemia. I will list currently approved IV iron products available to clinicians in the US. Next, I will review clinical efficacy and safety data from studies utilizing IV iron in patients with cancer specifically. Lastly, we will discuss scenarios in which clinical practice gaps exist due to the absence of robust evidence and how clinicians might approach these situations in the real world. Chemotherapy-induced anemia, also known as CIA, is the most common and persistent hematologic abnormality in patients with cancer with a prevalence between 30 to 90% reported in clinical trials. Importantly, for patients receiving therapy with curative intent, severe anemia may lead to treatment delay, limit the use of specific antineoplastic therapies, or lead to dosage reductions. Anemia has been shown in numerous studies to negatively impact quality of life in patients with cancer. Therefore, safe and effective strategies aimed at preventing or improving anemia are needed. The initial workup begins by identifying patients with a low hemoglobin. Afterwards, one looks to correct contributing factors which can be multifactorial. I systematically evaluate causes of anemia by categorizing possible etiologies into drugs, bugs, and diseases, and variables that decrease production, increase destruction, or lead to the loss of red blood cells. For a full review of cancer-associated anemia and its causes, of which CIA is a subset, the readers referred to the reference at the bottom of this slide. Importantly, contributing factors may arise throughout treatment. Thus, this step is a continual process that should be repeated until the patient is no longer receiving treatment and for several weeks afterwards to ensure anemia does not persist. While systematically evaluating for causes, clinicians worried about maintaining the dose intensity of chemotherapy cycles or those concerned with avoidance of packed red cell transfusion may wish to consider a workup of iron deficiency. Iron deficiency is easily identified using routine assays known as the serum ferritin and transferrin saturation. Importantly, patients with absolute iron deficiency anemia, or ADA, are more likely to respond to iron supplementation than those with functional iron deficiency anemia, or FIDA, and with a larger increase in hemoglobin. Data derived from anemic patients with cancer have allowed for algorithms such as this to be produced to help determine when IV iron may be helpful. Because of the use of erythropoietic stimulating agents or ESAs have been shown to cause harm in certain subsets of patients with cancer, clinicians sought to correct anemia via other modalities. IV iron monotherapy became the next logical step as studies using iron in conjunction with ESAs consistently showed an additive response. Importantly, unlike ESAs, data have not demonstrated serious harm with the use of IV iron, and therefore it may be considered for qualifying patients who are not receiving myelosuppressive chemotherapy, for patients with radiation-induced anemia, or for those whom an ESA is not indicated. Currently approved intravenous iron products available in the U.S. are shown here. IV iron can be used as monotherapy to treat absolute or functional iron deficiency with or without an ESA. Of note, no IV iron product carries a specific FDA-approved indication to treat anemia in patients with cancer. And interestingly, no distinction is made in any drug label as to whether the iron deficiency is due to an absolute or functional iron deficiency for any indication. That said, numerous studies demonstrating the benefit of IV iron in patients with cancer exist. Until 2021, prospective studies using IV iron as monotherapy for patients with CIA were limited to small sample sizes. Notably, the study by Steinmetz and colleagues was a non-randomized observational study. The follow-up for these studies ranged from as few as six weeks to 14 weeks after enrollment. In regard to efficacy, the majority of these nine studies showed an increase in hemoglobin or reduction in packed red cell transfusion requirement 
versus the control arm when a control arm was included. In 2021, Ironclad was the first randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study to use IV iron monotherapy in patients with CIA. Inclusion criteria were adults receiving chemo with any stage disease and who had functional iron deficiency anemia as seen here. Patients were randomly assigned to two infusions of either ferric carboxymaltose or FCM at a dose of 15 milligrams per kilo, not to exceed 750 milligrams per dose or placebo. The primary endpoint was the percentage of patients with a decrease in hemoglobin level of a half a gram per deciliter or more between weeks three and 18. The percentage of patients who had a drop in hemoglobin equal to more than 0.5 grams per deciliter from baseline is shown on the y-axis and time in weeks is shown on the x-axis. Therefore, a higher curve suggests a greater drop in hemoglobin. As you can see, a significantly higher percentage of patients receiving FCM, that is the blue bar, were able to maintain their hemoglobin within a half a gram per deciliter of their baseline throughout the study period. The majority of patients receiving placebo were unable to do this as shown on the upper curve in yellow, which again represents more patients who had a hemoglobin loss of 0.5 grams per deciliter or more. Other efficacy endpoints included the median time to hemoglobin decrease from baseline, which occurred much later with FCM. In addition, a statistically higher percentage of patients who received FCM achieved a hemoglobin of one gram per deciliter or higher as compared to placebo upon study completion at 18 weeks. This specific outcome has historically served as the primary endpoint in other studies in anemia. Overall safety with FCM was similar to the placebo arm, with the exception of neutropenia and hypophosphatemia. Low serum phosphorus levels were managed by dietary modification or a prescription for phosphate supplementation. Overall, this study raised no new safety signals, including no venous thromboembolism, or VTE, was seen in either arm. Significant mortality differences were not seen either. Although data are emerging, practice gaps still exist. Data are lacking to adequately identify the optimal time to administer IV iron. For example, while giving IV iron on day one of a cycle of chemotherapy, while it is more convenient, concomitant administration with free radical inducing cardiotoxic medications such as doxorubicin may not be ideal as it may potentiate adverse effects. In general, most safety concerns surrounding IV iron administration have centered on acute infusion related reactions. Serious adverse reactions are rare regardless of preparation. When milder reactions occur, they're often managed by interrupting the infusion and restarting at a slower rate. For patients reporting hypersensitivity to one product, I consider the use of the Montandan slow titration protocol, which has allowed some of my patients to receive IV iron after reporting intolerances to other preparations. There are still several important unanswered questions that remain regarding the safety of IV iron. A recent meta-analysis of more than 100 randomized clinical trials suggests that IV iron is associated with a slight increased risk of infection. However, there are concerns about the generalizability of these findings. An a priori subgroup analysis was performed to determine if certain clinical, biological, and therapeutic characteristics increase infection risk in distinct patient populations. Interestingly, although studies from patients with cancer undergoing treatment were included in the meta-analysis, which may arguably be the population at greatest risk of infection, they were not included in the subgroup and sensitivity analysis. Overall, obstetrics and chronic kidney disease made up three-fourths of the trials in the systematic review. As I mentioned before in the ironclad trial, neutropenia was more prevalent in the FCM arm. However, pyrexia was reported in 6% of FCM patients compared to 9.3% of placebo patients. Moreover, it's important to note that not all infections are siderophilic. A study using bioluminescent Staph aureus failed to show bacterial growth on a catheter in a low hepcidin, iron overloaded experimental model. Other unanswered questions regarding IV iron exist. A study by doctors Henry Dahl and Auerbach suggested that VTE risk may be augmented by the receipt of IV iron, possibly through downregulation of thrombocytosis which is commonly seen in patients with iron deficiency. Prospective data are needed to confirm the results of this important retrospective study and determine if IV iron has a protective role in the development of cancer-related VTE. Lastly, 
Short-term survival data and studies using IV iron, that is, data produced over 16 weeks or less, has not shown differences in mortality. However, most studies focused on efficacy and were not powered to detect a difference in overall survival. Longer follow-up studies are needed and to distinguish whether survival differences exist for patients with ADA versus FIDA. In summary, IV iron has the therapeutic potential to maintain hemoglobin within baseline levels in FIDA patients with cancer undergoing chemotherapy. Secondly, IV iron will likely improve hemoglobin in patients with both ADA and FIDA. This in turn may help to avoid delays or dose reductions for patients undergoing chemotherapy. Lastly, Longer term follow up data, such as one year or longer, is needed to determine the effect of IV iron on overall survival. When deciding how best to correct anemia, the medical community would benefit from knowing whether any differences in survival exist when IV iron is given to patients treated with curative versus palliative intent. Additionally, studies should compare survival outcomes for patients with cancer who receive IV iron for ADA versus FIDA. Until long-term survival data are available, the approach must be individualized to ensure that benefits outweigh any risks and that patients are engaged in the decision-making process.